morning, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Elder. I'm from Edinburgh uh, in Scotland. I did want to, I didn't get the chance to say yesterday just what a great pleasure it is for me to be here and to be part of the, the Stanford 25 team. It's my second visit here. And I think as a sign of our kind of developing union, uh, I'm today wearing a Stanford tie and Abraham's actually wearing the tie of one of the three UK colleges of physicians. It happens to be Edinburgh, but that, and I think we are working quite closely uh, together uh, on, on this business. So, um, Junaid Zaman is also from the UK, uh, and he and Abraham and I are going to try this morning to take you to another world, okay? Because it is very, very different, I think, what you're going to see here from what happens in the USA. I think what, what we want to try and do and press upon you is maybe the, the, the strap line underneath my main title there is that, you know, from summative to formative and back again, that the existence of a high stakes exam in, in bedside medicine drives all the bedside teaching at residency level in the UK. Yeah? So we, we don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about framework of teaching. The existence of the exam drives that. And that's critically important, particularly when you don't have a high stakes uh, exam. To do this, we're going to, um, I'm going to talk to some slides to begin with, just to give some context. Junaid's going to talk a bit about what it was like to sit an exam like this and what value he uh, sees in it. And then we're going to actually try and demo one part of the examination for you, one encounter as it, you know, as close as we can as to what it would actually be like. And we're going to ask you to assess the candidate that you see uh, as he goes through his paces, uh, literally. Uh, so I'll need to get the pointer. Uh, it's here on the bed. Um, sorry. Okay, so very briefly about MRCP UK. It's uh, a big operation. As you can see there, uh, there's about, we have about 25,000 candidates sitting our, we've got 15 different exams around the world. So one point right away is that these examinations are not just sat in the United Kingdom. They're mandatory in the United Kingdom, but trainees in many other parts of the world either have to sit them, excuse me, or, or choose to sit them. So in, in total, we're in about over 50 different countries. <coughs> Uh, in the bottom corner there, you can see the figure 2,000 clinical examiners. So to run the clinical exam around the world, that is the number of people that we need to have up to speed and trained uh, to be examiners. And as you can imagine, that's quite, quite a big call. That's all I'm going to say about uh, MRCP in general. The exam we're interested in today is this exam, uh, PACES, Practical Assessment of Clinical Examination Skills. And in, an, in a year, about 5,000 candidates around the world will sit the PACES either in the UK or in its 17 different centres now in about 14 different countries. So we've got four centres in India, uh, a couple now in Myanmar, uh, and you can see the other countries in red that take this exam, where trainees take uh, this exam. So it's got a, a wide spread. Um, I'm, I'm well used um, to giving talks about examinations, and as Steve McGee said yesterday when he was talking about insens sensitivity and specificity, I know that they can have a mind-numbing effect. So I am not on stage today going to get into a lot of detail, yeah, uh, exam speak. If anybody wants to ask me afterwards or email me about the detail of what we do, I'm happy to, to speak about it. But I'm not going to get into detail. Uh, but I want to make three broad general points at the beginning about the philosophy that drives all this for us. Um, I think many educationalists see that phrase, assessment um, um, drives learning, as a kind of an inconvenient truth. Yeah? People don't really like the fact that students look to exams, but the fact of the matter is they do. And there's nothing like a high stakes exam to make people learn something, be it knowledge or to perform in a certain way in a clinical skills exam. Now what that does is give people like me who are in charge of exams potentially great power to drive learning in the way you want, but also a lot of responsibility. Yeah? You don't want to put things that are unhelpful or unnecessary to patient care into your exams. But that's a critical part of the philosophy. Secondly, 
Um, I think that every time I speak about this, everybody agrees that there's more to being a doctor than what you know. Abram and I are both fond of using this slide to illustrate a variety of points about being a doctor. If you ask patients what they value in a doctor, it's not just knowledge, it's their bedside skills. So part of our philosophy is, why should we just invest in the assessment of knowledge? Surely we should also be investing in the assessment of bedside skills. And the third general point about exams I want to, to make, and sometimes people are a bit surprised by that phrase I've got at the top there, examinations are for, for patients. There's two people in the picture, one is the trainee, one is the, the patient. Hands down, every time, I will put the patient first. We have to make exams fair to trainees. They shouldn't be too intimidating for trainees, but if you come from the background I do, where we believe that these exams improve standards of patient care, you have to accept that, that the examination may be a little bit scary. It may be you can't standardize it like you can a written exam. But if the philosophy is that you're driving patient care, you have to accept that compromise. Okay, I wanted to take you through this just to compare the UK and the USA There's a, in, in terms of training to begin with. There's quite a lot we could talk, talk there uh, as, as it stands on that slide. For example, the fact that in the United Kingdom on the top there, there is no pre-med degree. So typically you'll go to university at 17 or 18. There's one great difference. You'll also see that after our medical degree course, everybody has to do what we call a foundation program of two years, then into core training, then into specialty training. And I've put the, uh, the, the parallel American model at the bottom. In, in each country, we have a highly developed, that's a euphemism perhaps, competency-based curricula, extremely detailed, multiple competencies that people are meant to attain. So that's common to us. We have programs of formative workplace-based assessments like the mini CEX meant to be delivered in the workplace in a systematic manner. So we're common in that way too. We also have our programs of summative high stakes exams. Here they are. In the US, you have USMLE, then two sets of boards if you specialize. In the UK, there's no national medical exam. There's just university finals. And then there's the three parts of the MRCP and then what we call an SCE, which is the equivalent of a specialist board's exam. The, so put like that, it looks broadly the same. The big difference is that one part of the MRCP is the bedside clinical skills exam. You cannot move on from your core training to your specialty training without passing that exam. So that's a fundamental difference. So, and some people, when I've spoken to people informally, I've been surprised to know this. In the UK, a high-stakes clinical skills exam is still mandatory. But that's not extraordinary. In, you know, in every other discipline in the United Kingdom, surgery, psychiatry, as well as your knowledge tests, there are still clinical skills exams of some sort. I know that we've got people from Australia here, people from Canada here. They have similar exams to us. Yeah, and what I should say, I'm not trying to say today that our way of doing it is the best. The fact of the matter is that all these countries have these exams. And since 1972, uh, when the American board decided to get rid of a similar kind of exam, the USA has not. And I'll, I, I would just ask you all to reflect on what that might mean for the way that physicians are trained uh, in, in this country. So why have we held on to PACES, a clinical skills exam? Well, at the top there, it's because we believe clinical skills are still important. Uh, next to that, going clockwise, we do believe that assessment drives learning and there's nothing like a high stakes exam to get people to, to, to learn or perform or behave in a particular way. We have found uh, at five o'clock there that our workplace based assessments are very good on paper but are very, very difficult to deliver. We do not end up directly observing what the trainee does enough times. Next to that, um, I've put message. And what I mean by that is that we believe that the existence of high stakes clinical skills exam sounds a, sends a really important message within the profession, but also to the public about what it is that the profession values. Yeah, I think if, 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 if in the UK we said, well, we're going to get rid of our bedside skills exam, there would be a problem. We have strong lay representation in all our examination boards. There would be an uproar, basically. 
if they said we were just reverting to knowledge tests only and to workplace-based assessments. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the final point I've got there is the educational impact of, of, of the existence of the exam, as I mentioned at the, uh, at the beginning there. And what do I mean by that? Well, for both trainees and trainers, the, 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 sheer, the mere existence of the exam drives a whole lot of other things. So trainees, they want to practice their bedside skills. Yeah, they go around in little packs and groups watching each other by the bedside. They seek out patients with physical signs. Yeah, because you, you may say it's just because they've got an exam to pass, but that's what they do. They read books about clinical skills. Their whole level of knowledge and practice is, is changed because of the existence of the exam. And similarly, for people like me, for trainers, well, lots of people are asked by their trainees to teach them. And as trainers, we don't want our folk failing paces. So we take time to watch them, to observe them by the bedside, to feed back on what they're doing. Some of us, like myself, get into the assessment of clinical skills and we become one of the 2,000 examiners that are needed to deliver the exam. And also in most hospitals that you'd go to in the UK, people are keeping patient databases. You know, so patients, outpatients with interesting or usable physical signs are recorded. And we have really next to no problem with patient participation. Patients are very, very keen, is our experience, to help both with the teaching of bedside skills and in these high stakes uh, exams. Okay, just a little bit about the detail with that frighteningly scary slide there of, uh, of what the PACES carousel looks like. I'm assuming you're all familiar with OSCEs. Um, basically, the, the, the numbers I've shown you there is the division of time within each encounter. There are eight encounters, so at the top there, the pulmonary physical exam is six minutes with the patient, four minutes talking to the examiner. And I'm not going to go through them all. As I say, I can speak to you in detail. Four of the, uh, afterwards, four of the stations are just physical exam. Two of the stations are just communication. Um, and two, the integrated care ones, are taking a history and focused, targeted physical exam. In six of the eight encounters, it's a real patient you'll be dealing with. You are observed at all times. And in your two hours going round that, a total of 10 different examiners have seen you, and each of them is marking you independently. There's no conferring on the marks that are awarded. It is impossible for one examiner, or even a pair of examiners, to fail you outright in one, one encounter. Um, the pass rate, I show you there, 65% for the first, time, for first attempt if you're a UK uh, graduate. And one of the things I say to people who say, well, you know, you don't really need these exams, I say, come along once. You know, you'll see people who've passed very difficult knowledge tests and, they, they, you know, it's, it's not complex clinical skills problems that pulls them down. It's because they can't speak to somebody or go through the basics of a physical exam. And that's a real strong message I want to give is that if you rely on your workplace-based assessments to get people to this level, in my belief, it will not happen. Uh, there is the seven clinical skills that we assess. I don't have time to tell you how, how we actually go about it, but you'll see that it doesn't just include skill A there, the, the, the technique of physical exam. We've got other things in there like communication, uh, down at the bottom there, F, managing patients' concerns, and G, maintaining patient welfare. So how you look after the patient during the encounter. And, and, how, and, and ensuring that you don't say anything that, or, or suggest anything that's unsafe for a patient in your discussion. How do we set the standard? Well, it's complex. The, for, uh, the, 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 the main message to get across is that each of these separate skills must be passed independently, right? So you cannot make up for being poor at physical exam, let's say, by being a good communicator or vice versa. You must clear each of these seven hurdles, and a further one, as you see there, total test score. Uh, so there's eight different pass marks, basically, that you've got to clear. And as I said, a 65% pass rate overall. Um, I, I'm a great believer in this too. I think that a, a lot of people get worried about the detail of their exam. And as I said earlier on there, of course you've got to try and make sure that the exam is not too intimidating for learners. 
uh, th that, that it is as standardized as you can, that it is as reliable as you can. But if you start off thinking you can make it as reliable as a knowledge-based assessment, it's not going to happen. Or as standardized as that, it's not going to happen. And you will end up not running a clinical skills exam at all. So whatever model you pick, ours, the Australian, the Canadian, I would say to you, the most important thing is that you have some form of assessment of clinical skills. Make it up yourselves. Um, canvas your own residents about what is acceptable to them, but have something that evaluates what, what you've taught and what level they've got to. My last two slides um, really try and talk to the whole issue of, well, what are we measuring? And what, what difference does it make? You know, if you coach people to pass an exam, they pass the exam. Are they better doctors? And that's why I put the bottom uh, point there, that the main objections, it seems to me, to these ty types of exams are that they're very stressful to learners, some people feel. Uh, and perhaps, you know, it's just all a construct. They're not really measuring anything that translates into real-life clinical practice. Now, if you, if you actually argue that through, you're going to have a problem having any kind of medical examination uh, at all. Because if you look for papers that link performance in examinations to patient care, I'd suggest to you you'd find two decent ones. One by John Narsini here in the States, uh, which looked purely at IMGs sitting USMLE, so a knowledge test, and he found very interestingly that the better you did in that test 15 years ago, the lower the mortality of your patients with acute myocardial infarction. So there's a, a link between performance and a written exam. And this is a Canadian study that kind of looked at it the other way around. Doctors that were judged by their peers as providing poorer care had done less well in both their written and clinical exams 15 to 20 years previously. But that's all the evidence you'll find for exams changing patient care. And at the end of the day, that could just be an association. Yeah? So there's nobody can tell you that running these exams definitely improves patient care. Although, as I've tried to stress, I think that is our uh, belief. Uh, there's lots more detail on our website. As I said, I'm happy for anybody to email me after the event uh, who wants to know more detail. That's all I want to start off with in terms of setting the scene. And now, Junaid's going to talk to us about what it's like to have been a candidate in PACES. Junaid. Can, can we, sorry, can we leave questions until the very end, I think, just from time management point of view? Thanks, Andy. So I'd like to thank Abraham, John, the organizers for inviting me to share some of my thoughts about how PACES has helped me. So I have a disclosure to make. I absolutely love clinical bedside examination. So uh, everything you hear will be colored with that flavor. So I'm a cardiology registrar here at Stanford and a Fulbright Scholar doing some research. But because of my passion for clinical exam, I've reached out to the BedMed group and have been involved with uh, their teaching program. But I just wanted to quickly run through, this is not something new. I was instilled with a passion from a good clinical teacher at Oxford who planted a seed that has taken root and will not shift. So I started with a medical education module, which I just wanted to echo some of the comments I heard yesterday about this is a final year clinical student teaching the first year clinical intake clinical skills. So we get taught clinical skills and then the final years are responsible for the first two weeks of clinical contact that the fourth year students will ever receive. So you have a very powerful impact and you derive and you assess a formative curriculum for them to pass and the students who take this love it because it really imprints on that see one, do one, teach one kind of idiom. Uh, after graduating from medical school, I stuck to this and became a junior clinical tutor. As Andy has uh, very elegantly elaborated, the MRCP is constructed of three different parts. The part one and part two are written. The paces is the, is the thing you're gonna see uh, me hopefully do in a couple of minutes. Um, and then after getting an academic number, I did a, a postgraduate certificate in medical education, became a clinical lecturer, and then reached out to the Stanford Bedside Medicine Program. So what I'm saying is this, the point of this is it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a bit of time, but one positive feedback, good inspiration to a young medical student can inspire a lifetime worth of learning. So it's fundamentally important to transmit this to the next generation. 
from a trainee perspective, so I've just got two or three slides up, essentially with uh, some brainstorming ideas as to what words came to my mind when I was thinking about this clinical skills exam. The number one word that came to my mind is pride. I was massively proud at passing paces. It is the single most difficult exam you have to face as a doctor in the UK. It's what you gear yourself for from the day you finish medical school, and arguably, uh, the better medical schools actually use the paces mark sheet you have in front of you as a construct for their OSCE so that you feel able and confident uh, when you have reached this exam. And it's not something you do you know, out of the box just for the exam. It's something that you've been learning towards because it is something that does prepare you for later learning. As a trainee, it gives you credibility. I can then put these four letters after my name. That, to anybody around the world and to people who know that means, means it's a certain standard of bedside medical examination has been passed. That's, a, that's a, 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 an important point, but I guess kind of associated with pride to an extent. Feedback. So you can destroy a career with negative feedback delivered in the wrong way. We've all seen from the examples and the small groups yesterday how great it is to have learners teach each other and how great it is to have positive feedback reinforced in learning. There is no one correct technique for any physical exam maneuver. There are ones that are just more reliable and better and that you trust. So just because someone does something differently doesn't mean you immediately slap them down to say that's incorrect. So how you give feedback is very, very important at how you shape a young learner. And that's something that, again, as a more senior uh, educator, you should be extremely aware of. The negative feedback uh, at the wrong stage can entirely retard this process. Um, so positive, positive, positive. They are stressful. This exam is stressful. I've got a site tachycardia now, and I'll, I will have one even knowing that this, uh, this is a mock exam because it's a high state clinical exam. Alongside that, it costs money. The exam costs money, or as, the, as do the boards here. The courses, of which there are quite a few in the UK designed to train you for this exam, also cost money. But this is, again, part and part of postgraduate training across the world. So that's a relatively minor point. It gives you something, and I'll go on to this in my uh, kind of final side, that a work-based placed assessment does not give you. It gives you confidence. I would argue strongly a work-based paced assessment gives you competence. They are competency-based exams with a low bar to make sure you're safe. They do not give you confidence to go and disseminate that knowledge or to run a medical take by yourself or to call your neurology attendant up and say, this lady has an upgrade implanter and to stick by it. That's where PACES comes in and that's, uh, a, a, you cannot put a price on that, in my personal opinion. I see it as a gateway. If I didn't do this exam, I couldn't be where I am now. You can't become a registrar in the UK without passing MRCP PACES. Uh, and membership, you feel part of a club. And as a result, I'm very much opposed to now removing this exam because actually I'm part of this club and it's a rite of passage, right? Which is that if I did it and I think it benefits me, then I think everyone else should do it. So membership is the M in MRCP. So from a, um, from a teaching point of view, because I've now had the opportunity uh, after that to participate in PACE's teaching, uh, and again, I was uh, always probably attuned to this kind of thing, um, and certainly at Stanford, I've been trying to adopt a similar role. Um, PACE's teaching can be formalized, but my first word is opportunistic. Grabbing moments of teaching when they arise without the need for formal construct or drama. So we're all trying to get you in this symposium to come away with a piece of learning, a five minute moment, an actual deliverable that you can then disseminate to your home institutions to put this into practice. That's great, but that can be an informal moment. It can be a, an opportunistic asking a resident by the bedside to, to do something, discussing some scars. Lots of different examples, which we'll hopefully see later on this afternoon. Presentation, as Andy said, is critical. You can be the best physical examinator, examiner in the world, but if you cannot communicate your findings to, a, uh, to attendants in four minutes and answer questions, then you're not going to be much good as a doctor calling up someone on the phone, referring a patient in ER, taking a referral. So presentation and organization of your thoughts before one speaks is extremely integral to this exam. And in many respects, the best candidates who I've taught, and Andy will probably echo this, are the people who can communicate their findings most succinctly and most elegantly in the shortest amount of time. That's actually what makes you part. It's like a driving test. You have to play the game, but that game is one that patients 
really like, because if you can communicate well to examiners, chances are you'll be a good communicator to the patient when you're explaining a complex diagnosis. You have to be adaptable. I think that goes kind of hand in hand with, with opportunistic, but you have to be able to, to go with what you're given. So if you don't have a real patient, you use a simulated patient, like yesterday's sessions. You make things up on the fly. You try to make the group interested and engaged with whatever you're given. Um, it's great if you have a real patient. They are extremely, extremely um, priceless, and we're very thankful to obviously George for coming in again. But the adaptability in teaching is really important. Hand in hand, you have to protect teaching time. So much as uh, it's opportunistic and all of the things I've mentioned in terms of flexibility, there were a um, few SHOs or, or residents in the hospitals I worked at who used to compile ward lists, and that's one of the other points I got down, ward roster, of whenever they saw a patient on the acute take, they'd write down the name of the patient, the physical sign, and which bed they're in. And every day at 5 o'clock or seven, 6 or 7, whenever the medical registrar, who is me, finished their daily rounds, you'd go around for one hour on these patients, so you didn't have to go do the hard work to find them, and you'd ask someone who didn't write the name down, I who didn't know the patient, in front of a small group of four or five to examine them and to present in front of their peers at the bedside like they would in a rural exam. And that protection is after work, essentially. So you do it after work, and it's a daily or most typically kind of bi twice weekly event. And this is uh, often led by the residents who come to you asking for you to do this because they've got their exams coming up. Um, patients, patients, patients. I don't need to explain that any more patients are fundamentally important. Teaching is about the patient. And you need, as a teacher, to address, respect, and manage the patient as much as you are focusing on the trainee. So you, 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 you really have to uh, involve them. And as um, Errol showed you yesterday with a slide when I examined this patient with aortic regurgitation, the family were also involved in that consultation. And they came away with a really a much better understanding of aortic regurgitation. They knew far more uh, about endocarditis than they did at the start of the consult. And it's an example of how it's a two-way process. So the patient can benefit hugely from teaching if you explain you're going to use jargon, if you explain that you'll be talking over them for short periods of time, and to please interrupt them, you know, interrupt you if you say anything that they would like to further details about. The ward roster I've talked about, it takes time to clinically teach. It takes you know, an hour to prepare a patient go find someone for a 10-minute examination practice. It does take time, but as I've alluded to, there are ways to make it flexible and make it more opportunistic. And finally, you have to be motivated. You really have to want to do this because uh, you're not you know, being reimbursed with it. You're not doing anything clinical. It's taking time away from your research, your clinical, whatever it is. So you have to have the motivation. And I think obviously everyone in this room does because you're all in this room. I'm preaching to the converted in that sense. So. Um, so what does uh, PACES compare to a workplace PACES assessment? Well, as I've already alluded to, PACES makes one confident. Medical school finals are geared towards it. You have specific high-yield courses that you can go to to improve your confidence and to see a very wide range of bizarre diagnoses. So the week before my PACES, again, being you know, kind of um, uh, subject to the same nerves as everyone is, I signed up on these courses, saw a VSD, Friedrich's ataxia, retinitis pigmentosa, all the things that you probably would take you know, a month to see in a normal ward in one room in the space of five hours, which was amazing. But they are geared towards that and to help you improve your efficiency. A daily ward rounds become teaching hunts, so sign hunts. So the patient who has the diastolic murmur becomes famous throughout the hospital and gets a whole stream of residents coming to politely ask them if they wouldn't mind examining him. As I've said, I think a workplace pace assessment is fantastic for giving you competence, to making sure your attendant sees what you're doing and you're not doing anything alarming. Culturally, so paces changes every single interaction you have with a patient. So I'm just going to repeat that. Culturally, paces changes every single interaction you have with a patient. In, in the few months immediately before, obviously, the few months after is when you have the aura of the MRCP exam and you're very happy, and arguably lifelong. For me, certainly, and I'm only preaching what I can tell you from my own story, but uh, it really does drive everything if you uh, strive to attain the standards which it sets. And finally, it reinforces that doctors really are always learning and we should always teach. It's one of the most fundamental bits of being a doctor. So take care messages.
and as I said, it's just been a very a brief journey about my personal perspective. Bad clinical teaching is extremely harmful. So please don't do it. Negative feedback destroys young careers. So please remember that. Good clinical teaching, on the other hand, inspires a lifetime worth of change. So please do that. High stakes exams can shape learning and training. Passion and interest in teaching are fundamentally important. Again, I'm not going to label that point to this audience. Patients with signs are our most precious commodity, and patients who are willing to come and help with exams are like gold dust. So hence, we, we store them. We make a repository. We make sure that you know, they are, are, are happy to be involved, because without them, this would all fall apart. Presentation is crucial to passing the exam. Seize the small moments of teaching. And that's, again, we'll go through this as you curate your five-minute bedside moment later on today. But seize the small moments as well as the big moments. And then competence and confidence should be the goals for you to instill in your trainees. And so with that, I'd like to close. And thank you very much for your time. Good. Now, okay. so we're, we're going to move on to the next bit now. And um, very good use of the phrase gold dust. For a patient, because in fact today we don't have gold dust, we have a jewel. <laughs> jewel. So, Jewel, would you like to come up onto the stage now? Uh, uh, let, let me explain. Junaid, thanks, uh, Jewel. We'll get it slightly out of the way. Junaid has already passed this exam. He wasn't present yesterday and hasn't previously examined. Um, sounds like a magic trick. I'm explaining here. Uh, examined um, the, the patient. Junaid's going to disappear now, and I'm just going to take you through what, what we're going to do together as a kind of a practical exercise together. Okay. Junaid, thank you. We'll I see you in a few, a few minutes. Yeah. So, um, on your, so, so what, we're going to just try and give you a flavor of one of the encounters, and that's going to be the neurology physical exam encounter, which lasts 10 minutes. The candidate has six minutes uh, with the, the patient and four minutes being asked some questions by an examiner. The whole time he's watched by two examiners, and Abram's going to be the other examiner. On your seats when you came in today, I don't know how well you'll be able to read them in this light, but there's, there's one sheet of paper. Uh, on one side, you'll see, if you read closely at the top, it's got the word calibration. And on the other side, it says mark sheet. So try and find the one that says calibration at the top. And then I'll explain to you what we need to do to assess the candidate. Because real patients are being used, you can set some generic standards for each of the skills that you're going to assess. And if you glance at the mark sheet, you'll see there are very, very broad statements next to each of the five skills that are there. Like for skill A, well, I've got it here. It says, um, oh, I don't have it here. It says, you know, conducts a fluent, uh, thorough, systematic physical examination. So it's a generic statement. Um, when we're using a real patient, though, we've got to pre-agree what it is that we're going to, that the, the specifics are going to be for each of these assessment domains. And that's what Abram and I are going to show you a little bit of. And just let me take you through this. Yeah, so... I want you all to try and be examiners, assessors today. The photography, is, the camera works fantastic. You're going to be able to see and hear what's going on. It starts off, will, though, with the idea that you are setting your own standard for this candidate's performance. And I'm going to develop on that just a little bit. The purpose of it is just to give you a flavor, as I say, and also to see what implications you might, be, you might think there are in this kind of model for the way you teach. So the only information that the candidate has when they come into the room is that statement there. They know that it's going to be a neuro case, but all they're told is that this patient recently noticed difficulty in walking. Please examine the upper and lower limbs neurologically to identify a cause. Right? So you might say that's a bit false, not enough of a history to get a proper differential, certainly. But on the other hand, it certainly focuses things just on the physical exam, as you'll see. So the candidate knows that they're going to be asked to examine some aspect of the nervous system before they come in the room, but they don't know precisely what. They know they've got six minutes to complete their physical exam. They'll be told when they've got one minute left. And it's their time. Within that six minutes, they can go back and do something again. They can even do it again. It looks less and less good the more times that you, you do something. But, you know, it's their time. 
Uh, we will not stop them or interrupt them, but when six minutes is up, we will bring it to an end, whatever stage they've got to in their exam, and then we'll have a conversation with one of the examiners only. So zero to six minute candidate examines the patient. They're not allowed to take any historical details and we'll explain to the patient that they shouldn't volunteer any information uh, to, to the candidate. And for the, le the remaining four minutes is to say there's this interaction with the uh, examiner. Now, I say in setting a standard with um, real patients, you've, we've got to examine the patient together and, uh, and uh, identify what signs are actually there. So, Abram and I, are in, in a moment, are going to agree what physical signs we think are there. We will take into difficulty, in, into account how difficult the patient is to examine. Yeah, so if it's a patient who's not so compliant, then we'll, we will adjust the, our, our assessment of the candidate, because that's real life. And we're, what we're, ex, we're, we're trying to work out is, can, you know, in comparison to us, what can this candidate do? Uh, we might have in the real exam access to the patient's echo or their CT scan, but that's never shown to the candidate. Similarly, our examiners examine blind. They're not given a list of the signs that are there. So it's based on what they themselves can find as, a, as an attending or consultant level. So you, we're asking you to think, what is it reasonable in six minutes in each of these domains to expect somebody at, let's say, end of residency level to pull off, to do. And we agree the criteria, but then we mark independently. Um, so the final thing I want to say about this idea of calibration, to say it's all, all has to be done like this because we're using real patients. This is a general medical level exam. It's not neurology fellowship. So you're not, you know, if any of you are a neurologist, you're not pitching it as what you'd expect a neurology fellow to do. You're pitching it at what you'd expect to say a third year IM resident to do. Uh, often, well, we promote the idea of, you know, the thumbnail level of competence or ability. You know, if, if you were in a clinic and this young doctor were seeing your patients next door, would you be comfortable with what they've done? Yeah, would you be happy? with what they've done? Would you be happy with the way they describe what they've found to you? Would you be happy with the way they interpret or go through the really quite simple factual questions that are going to be asked? This isn't a high level factual exam at all. It focuses on clinical skills. And similarly, would you entrust this doctor if they were at the front door seeing patients who are going to be admitted under your name with the kind of assessment that you actually see them doing? That's the kind of level we're pitching at. Okay, so there are five skills that are assessed in this encounter, and uh, I'll just very quickly run through which, what, what each is. So skill A, physical exam. What you're looking at there is the person's technique and what they cover. They've only got six minutes. You should decide what, what would a candidate, if, if a candidate, let's say, didn't test tone at all, would that be unsatisfactory for that domain. You've only got two choices on the mark sheet for each skill, satisfactory or unsatisfactory. So you need to think at this level, what will I not permit to happen, yeah, before I give an unsatisfactory. For skill B, what you're, what you're going to think about is what would you expect a young doctor of the physical signs that are there to find? And how badly would you punish them, as it were, if they find something that isn't there. And candidates do find things lots of times, in real life they do as well, that are not physical signs that are not present. And I say, we're going to show you just now the physical signs that we think are present. In skill D, differential diagnosis, all it is is we're just going to be asking the candidate after he finishes the exam, well, you know, how would you explain these findings? There's not a detailed history there. And the examiner may introduce some elements of history, again, as a way of trying to test their clinical judgment. But it's quite simple level differential diagnosis that they're being asked about. Skill E is judgment. And that applies to the way they're interpreting, they're applying their knowledge to the clinical situation. I'll ask almost certainly some very simple uh, questions about what kinds of investigations or treatment a patient in this situation, this patient, may require. And then finally, there's this. Uh, skill which almost everybody passes, you'll be pleased to hear, called maintaining patient welfare. And that's really just there to ensure that 
um, the, the candidate cares for the patient through the encounter. But you know, what I would like you to do is to think, well, what might a candidate do that would make you say, well, they didn't look after that patient? What would make it unsatisfactory? So I've rattled through that, but all, what we're wanting you to do is to think about criteria that would uh, be rewarded by a satisfactory judgment in each of these five domains or an unsatisfactory judgment. Once Abra and I, and I have demonstrated the signs, we'll give you sort of, I don't know, five to 10 minutes, maybe to speak with the person next to you and throw some ideas around about the criteria that you would actually apply. So it's a bit complex to explain, uh, but uh, once we've finished examining, we'll maybe just see if there's any, any questions. That's all the slides. So Abram, can I ask you to come up on stage? I'll move this over here. So, um, I don't know your surname. Wilk. Mrs. Wilk, Miss Wilk, Ms. Wilk. Mrs. Jewel, thank you, I've met you before. Thanks for coming along and helping in the examination today. Um, we're just gonna see one candidate. He's gonna be very nervous, but what he has to do is to show us whether or not he can examine you properly. I know you've been examined lots of times before, but we are looking to see what he does, and then we'll be asking him a few questions. At the end of it all, if you've got any questions about what happened, then I'm the, the person to, to ask about it, because sometimes the candidate will say things that are just plain wrong, and I wouldn't want you to, I wouldn't want you to be alarmed by anything that the, the, the candidate says. So we'll have a chance to do that uh, at the end. Can I ask you just to relax back? Okay, I'll move this a little bit out the way here. So I know that Abrams, uh, my co-examiner, he's, he's examined you earlier. And if I just prop you up here, we just want to have a little bit uh, of a look here. So um, I wonder if there's a slight loss of muscle bulk up here, Abram. I'd, perhaps it's pretty subtle. Can you sit up, Joe, for us, please? We're not getting it on the screens. Yeah, maybe. I, won I wonder. Yeah, I if think there's so. A, yes, there, so there so. might be slight wasting. Back you go here. Yeah. And I don't see any uh, fasciculation at all. A quick look. If I now just take your hand here, I just want you to relax as much as you can. And can I feel this side? Right, okay, well I, I would, I feel there, Abram, that the tone is slightly increased okay, here. I agree. But it's subtle. Yes. Yeah, but it, I think it's, there's definitely asymmetry of tone uh, in the, the upper limbs. If I come to the lower limbs, I'm just going to rock this here. I'm just going to jerk your leg a little bit, Joe. Try and relax. Pretend you're asleep. I know it's difficult when somebody's throwing your legs around. Right, well again, I think particularly proximally here, there, there is an impression of slightly increased tone. So I would be saying at the moment that there is asymmetry of tone uh, right to left. Uh, Jewel, can I ask you to put your hands out like this, palms up to the ceiling. Close your eyes, please. I'm going to try and move your hands, and you have to stop me doing that, okay? Keep them exactly where they are. Okay, can you squeeze my fingers as hard as you can? Okay, pull me towards you, please. Push me away. Good. Can you, you can open your eyes now. Can you make wings? Keep your arms like that. Don't let me push them down. And Come down to your side. Don't let me push them up. Okay, well, I would, again, feel that there's very slight weakness in the right very upper slight. limb, maybe four plus, yep. but, it, but it is there. Yep. It's, it's uh, detectable. In the lower limbs, can I ask you to raise this leg off the bed? Keep it up, don't let me push it down. Same again here. Don't let me push it down. Down onto the bed. Don't let me lift your leg from the bed, please. Same again here. Good, can I lift your leg, please? If you keep it straight, don't let me bend your leg. Good, and bend it now, please. Heel to bottom. Don't let me straighten it. Okay, relax. Same again here. Keep your legs straight, please. Don't let me bend it. And bend it now. Don't let me straighten. Okay, are you aware of a difference in power in the legs there? Yeah. Again, it feels very slightly weaker to me. And um, we spoke yesterday about what a good job you've done with rehab since the, the, the event happened. But I think there's still discernible uh, asymmetry Slight. of power. Mm -hmm. Can you pull your toes up towards you, please? Keep them up, don't let me push them down. 
Down towards uh, Abram, and don't let me put them up. Okay, uh, reflexes, we'll need a hammer here. And what we'll do is I'll just quickly come here, just relax your leg there. Again, you'll try and pretend that you're asleep. Okay, so the jerk is there on the left, but with a similar stimulus, I think that this is so. asymmetrical, that this is pathologically increased. So let me do this here, Jewel, again. Where's my tender hammer up there? So it's unequivocally present. I think there's not much between them. So I think the knee jerk here is, is brisker than the left, perhaps um, symmetrical here. And plan turn, scratching the sole of your foot now. That is <coughs> unresponsive planter. I would say we're going to quickly, how are we doing for time? 44. We're going to come to the upper limbs. You relax your arm there. I'm doing this quicker than I would in, the, in real life calibration, obviously. Uh, just try and relax. Same again here. So very light stimulus there. Similar there, I think unequivocally hyperreflexic here. <coughs> Ditto. So similar stimulus. Quite brisk there. I don't know how well you're seeing this. But I would again say that all these reflexes are brisker. And there's a positive uh, Hoffman sign there but not here. Okay, thank you for doing that. We're nearly done. Uh, can I just very quickly test your sensation, okay? So if you close your eyes for me, do you feel me touch you? All I want you to do is to say yes every time you feel me touch you. In fact, let's make it a bit tougher. You say left or right, depending on which side I touch. Okay, can we open your eyes? Can you touch your nose with that finger? Touch my finger? Back and forth between the two as quick as you can. Okay, try the left, please. Are you right or left-handed? I'm better. Okay, touch your nose, please. Okay, good. Let's do the same down here. So that isn't normal on the right, but that may simply be a function of the power. Uh, he's not going to be able, we're not allowing him to examine for other cerebe cerebellar signs. Uh, so I, I would interpret that as being related to slight weakness. Can you put this heel on your shin, please? Down to, and back up again to your knee. Quick as you can, thank you. And try again now with right on left. Good. Your hypertonia interfering as yeah, well. Yeah, again, yeah. So can, I think finally, can we ask you just to walk for us, Jewel? Maybe if you walk around the front of the stage there. I think that right arm may not be swinging yeah, as Yeah, I think the, the right arm, can you just do it again? Perhaps doesn't swing as much as the left, but that's subtle again. And then finally, Jewel, if you come around the back here, keep you standing. I put my hands here. I won't let you fall. Can you close your eyes? So Romberg's is negative. I think you'd done proprioception yes. earlier and it was perfectly normal. Fine. Yes. And sensation in more detail sensation was normal. Sensation, I agree, okay. was normal. Good. Yeah. Have a seat there on the bed. So that, that is an idea of what the two examiners will have gone through independently. They will then uh, spend some time speaking about what they agree to be present and what they expect the candidate to be able to find in the time that they have. They will also discuss these other domains of performance and what they would expect the candidate to do in the time available uh, to them. So as I said, perhaps now if we just, each person maybe speaks to the person next to them and has an idea of some criteria that you would apply to assess a candidate in each of these uh, domains of performance, and then we'll get the candidate in and see what he does. Okay, well, I rattled through that. Yeah, I hope I've given you enough of an explanation to enable you to just try and set any criteria 
yourself for some, maybe not all of those domains. If people felt able to do that based on what I've explained, pop your hand up if you've been completely unable to do it. <laughs> right, OK, so, so that's fine. See, because well, this isn't science here. We're, we're just trying to give you a flavor of what it's like. I would also say we wouldn't usually have our patient completely exposed all the time, but Jules perfectly comfortable like this and warm enough, yeah? Yeah. Um, with calibration, each examiner pair will have either one or two, sometimes three cases to calibrate before the exam starts. And there's a rule that the exam does not begin until each pair of examiners have agreed what they're going to assess the candidate uh, on. Yeah? Even if that delays the start of the exam, because we've got to have the examiners in agreement about what, how they're going to assess uh, the candidate. So, that, so that's critical. So Abram, maybe if you want, to, for this part, just to be, to be over there. Uh, the other thing I would say is, too, is that we're, we don't wear suits and ties in the exam. It's dresses you would in the wards, which in the UK is no tie, shirt sleeves rolled up uh, for examiners and for, for candidates. So it's not got this kind of stiff, formal look that it, that it, that it, has, that it has here. So, OK, so I think we're ready to go. Jewel, are you OK? Good, OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to get my stopwatch on here, and we're going to invite our candidate in. So Dr. Zaman, I'm Dr. Elders, and my co-examiner, Dr. Verghese. So this is your uh, CNS uh, patient, uh, and you've, as you know, you've got uh, six minutes to examine the patient. I'll tell you when there's one minute left, and then we'll have about four minutes to have uh, a chat about your findings. Uh, there's the information that we're going to give you. This patient recently noticed difficulty in walking. Please examine the upper and lower limbs neurologically to establish a cause. Okay. And there's the equipment that you might need here, okay. and you may want to just wipe Great. your hands to begin with. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Hello, Hi. my name is Dr. Zaman. Nice uh, I'm just going to examine your arms and legs. Would that be OK? Yes. Are you comfortable as you are? Are you in any pain at the moment? Um, no. OK, please let me know if anything I do cause a discomfort at all. I'm just going to stand at the end of bit and look at you just for a little while, if that's OK. Can I ask you just to uh, put your arms out in front of you? Close your eyes. Keep your hands where they are. OK, now relax both arms down. Now let me just take the weight of them. OK, that's fine. I'm just do the same with the other arm. I'm just going to test your strength now, OK? For this, I'm just going to ask you to hold your elbows up. I'm going to keep your arms up like wings, and everything I do, push against me. So I'm going to push down on both your arms. Please push against me. OK. Can I get you now to um, bring your arms, keep your arms up, and now bring them down into your side. And again, I'm going to push against you. OK, that's very good. With your right arm, please do this. Keep your arm as it is. Pull me towards you. Push me away from you. And the same with the left arm. You can put the right arm down. Pull me towards you. Push me away from you. OK, can I get you now to straighten both your arms out in front of you? Bend your wrists backwards and keep the wrists locked like that. OK, keep this one locked. Can I get you to bend the wrist downwards now? Thanks. And again, just everything I do to the opposite. Thanks. Fingers out straightened together. Keep the fingers straight. Don't let me bend them. Keep the fingers straight. That's fine. Can I get you to make a, a pincer with both hands? I'm going to pull through both first with the right and with the left. Stop me. OK. Can I get you to put your palms upwards, please? Can I get you to raise your thumb up like that? Keep the thumb as it is. I'm going to try to push against you. OK. Same with the left hand. Keep your thumb as it is. I'm going to push against you. Can I get you to put your hands like this? Bring your little finger up to touch mine. Push against me. OK. This hand the same. So 
uh, give me the three fingers, bring your little finger out to touch my insiders and push against me. That's very good. I'm just going to tap your reflexes now, okay? Thank you, Dr. Ola. Let's get you to cross your arms across here. Let the arms sink into the, the, um, the belly so don't support any weight. And bring your uh, right arm on top of your left hand. Is that painful? Yep, it does. Okay. And the left arm on top of this. I'm just going to ask you to do some tapping now. So can I ask you with your right hand to tap the back of your left hand in a rhythm, like so? Can I ask you now in between each tap to turn? So tap, turn, tap, turn, tap, turn. And just keep doing that if you could as regularly as possible. Okay, can I ask you now to repeat the same with your left? So your left hand on top of your right, tap a rhythm. Now in between each tap, turn, tap, turn. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. I'm now going to test your um, sensation or how you feel. So for that, I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes. Um, I'm just going to do some of my fingers first of all. Um, can you feel me touching you? In fact, let's put the arms down by the side. I'm just going to get some cotton wool. One actually. minute left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, can you feel me touching on both sides? Yes. Does it feel the same? Yes. Yes. Same on both sides? Yes. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to quickly go onto your legs now, if that's okay. Um, so just, uh, you can open your eyes, just relax. Uh, I'm just going to roll your legs around like rolling pins. Now I'm going to test the power in your legs. So lift your legs straight off the bed, keep it six inches up, and push against me. Pull it down into the bed. Very good. Lift this one up, keep it up. Push against me, lift, push it, pull it down into the bed. Bend this knee at uh, 90 degrees. Kick me off the bed. Pull me towards you, pull your heel towards your bum. Thank you. Same with the left, so switch over, pull, push me away from you. Pull me towards you. That's fine, thank you very much. Can I get you now to um, bring your feet up towards you? And now step down on my hands like their pedals, good. Bring your big toes up towards you. That's fine. I'm going to test the reflexes, relax the legs. In fact, that's time now. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. So, thank you very much. If you want to come around. So, Dr. Verghese, come around here. So, we've been able to watch you examining this patient with this recent history of difficulty in walking. Were you able to complete your examination? I was unable to complete my full neurological examination. What would you have liked to have done had you had more time? So I would like to have completed my lower limb examination, uh, specifically the reflexes, sensation, uh, assess the patient's gait, perform a Romberg sign, and then perform a cranial nerve examination at the end of that to fully assess the Okay, well, we, we, we may come back to that. On the basis of what you've been able to do, and you know, would you like to just describe any findings at all that you've, uh, you, you yes, can... Yes, so in summary, this uh, lady has signs of a right upper motor neuron uh, uh, weakness in her right arm. She has a, uh, an increase in tone with hyperreflexia and um, some slight uh, reduction of power, quite a subtle four plus out of five on uh, distal extremities which would be consistent potentially with um, a number of lesions but would be most likely a left MCA syndrome infarct. Okay, you've mentioned that it's predominantly distal. Do you recognise any different patterns of muscular weakness in, in a limb? Uh, so typically a more distal weakness would be uh, the differential would include a neuropathy or uh, as in a motor or sensory neuropathy and uh, the unilateral nature of it means that it could be a, a, a root problem or a, level, a problem at the, at the level of the um, spinal cord affecting the plexi. Okay. But again, there was no findings on the left uh, upper limb. So, so the left upper limb is normal? Correct. And the, 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 you've said to us that you believe it's an upper motor neuron lesion. Correct. And there's no doubt about that. The triceps was slightly brisk on the left side as well, but it was pathologically brisk on the right-hand side. 
Okay, so what, what findings might you anticipate in the lower limbs? Uh, so in the limited examination I managed to perform, she did have some slight hint of increased tone in the right leg. Uh, power was slightly reduced on knee uh, flexion, um, and I would expect there to be brisk reflexes at knee jerks and ankle and from flex. what you've been able to do, what kind of functional deficit do you think this patient will have? Um, well, if she were to be right-handed, she would experience difficulty with any activities of daily living. So, and walking, uh, do you anticipate that it would be I'd, impaired significantly? I would imagine there would be a slight um, uh, gait issue with the right leg being okay. stiffened. Now, and if you were able to ask the patient some questions, what, what would be important questions in your mind to ask them? Uh, important history to take would be the... Uh, time of onset. This okay, well, I'll stop you there because, in fact, this lady woke up no. with the deficit. Does that suggest any particular diagnosis to you with these signs? Well, it could. It she could was well work. when she went to her bed and she woke up with a weak right arm. I mean, the sudden onset of that suggests a vascular cause, so a stroke would be uh, high up on my list of differentials. Okay, if she came to, to your ER with that story, woken up from sleep, just tell us some of the key parts of your... Uh, management over either further investigation on physical exam or or further tests you would like to do? So you'd, uh, I would like to perform a full cranial nerve examination including uh, fundi, visual, fillers to check for any associated pathology. Investigations uh, importantly would include a coagulation profile to check for a bleeding disorder, a CT scan of the head and a basic uh, investigation such as an EKG to check for atrial fibrillation. Okay, so out, uh, my final question was, out with the examination of the nervous system, what would be the most important things that you would want to look for on physical exam? So uh, irregular pulse from atrial fibrillation to give an, uh, an underlying embolic cause of her stroke and as, alongside any potential uh, infective symptoms as to whether this was a, an infective embolus or some other kind of embolic phenomenon. Okay, a bell has gone oh. in the distance. Our time is up. Thank you so, very much. thank you very much. Somebody will show you where to go thank to your you. next case. Okay. Um, Jill, can you stay up here for just now? We may, because we may come back. So, that's a flavour of, of paces, right? I, I, we've, we've deliberately asked Junaid to, to go out because we, we, Junaid's never examined the patient before, as I, as I perhaps said. When we did a similar exercise, with the Stanford residents, with, when he deliberately got a whole lot of things quite badly wrong, we had great difficulty in getting them to say in front of him that he'd done anything wrong. In fact, it made me feel that I should perhaps change our rating system from not from satisfactory and unsatisfactory to awesome and slightly less than awesome. <laughs> because, because, because there was just a, bit, just a bit of a reluctance. So all, all we wanted to do, I guess, was if we just very quickly, we'll just go through each of these domains. And all I want you to do is to pop your hand up in the air if you felt he was unsatisfactory. First of all, in A, his, his method of examination. Was it an unsatisfactory performance? Well, Abraham and I had discussed beforehand that we thought it was unreasonable to expect a resident at this stage in six minutes to get through everything of upper and lower limbs. So in fact, in the real exam, we wouldn't put upper and lower. We've just done that today to make, make the point. So, and I think, Abraham, my feeling was his technique there was, was good enough and his coverage was good enough to merit a satisfactory judgment for that domain. Yeah, I agree. What did you he, mark? He seemed very fluid and comfortable right. and clearly he's done it a lot before. Yeah. So, so, and we wouldn't discuss this in real life. We'd only discuss it once our mark sheets are in. The marking is independent. So for identifying physical signs, yeah, I tried to show you what I thought was there. Do you think he got a fair number or not? So pop your hand up if you think he was unsatisfactory for identifying physical signs. B. Okay, I agree. What did you think? I agree. Okay, and then I think we're on to D at a really quite a, as much, you know, a basic level of differential because he's not got a detailed history. What did you think of his discussion about his own findings? Did anybody think it was unsatisfactory? No. Um, and in our own discussion in a moment, we'll have a chance to maybe think about that a bit more. I don't think I, I had a problem with anything that you said factually or he didn't suggest anything unreasonable or left, you know, completely from left field. So I was comfortable with that. It felt to me like he'd seen patients like this before and he could suggest the common uh, causes of, a pre of, of this kind of presentation. And then we had a brief 
discussion about management, yeah? So was there anything there that worried you about his performance? As I said at the beginning, this is not a high level factual exam, yeah? But was there anything there that anybody wants to pop their hand up and say that was, they felt would merit an unsatisfactory judgment? Nope, Junaid's going to be pleased with this response. <laughs> um, and then finally, there's the you know, looking after the patient. Was he courteous to them? Did he speak to her nicely uh, through it and kind of look after her? Did anybody feel that he was unsatisfactory there? No. Okay, good. Let's have Junaid back in. And then we can really have a discussion about anything at all, either what you've seen or talks at the beginning, the whole... Uh, shebang, as it were. Okay. Shall I take Jeanette and I mean, Jewel? Yeah. yeah. Jewel, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks very much. Thank you. So, Jeanette, what, what did you think there? How did you get on? Um, did I pass? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm well, competitive. Rem <laughs> remember, there's, there's more to life than just passing. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But in fact, you've had more, ex you've been exposed to more examiners today than you ever have. Ever want to be. <laughs> and, and in fact, not one unsatisfactory judgment was made about oh, you at thank all. Thank you very much. So I think under the lights in particular, <laughs> well, well, right. well done. Obviously, you didn't get through the whole routine, but as you and I know, we wouldn't actually give yeah. the, the, full, you know, the full upper and lower uh, in the exam, How, but you know, thinking about it after you went out, what did you feel about it? Did you feel yourself, oh gosh, I didn't do that, or I said something that was wrong, or? No, I thought my time management was poor, clearly, because I, I was looking at the clock uh, and knowing I had six minutes, I still was surprised when you said you have one minute and I hadn't even finished yeah. my upper limit. I have a habit so of surprising people fine. in these situations. So I, I think, think time management <laughs> clearly needs some some work, but um, uh, physical exam was, I, I may have actually in the exam asked the patient to walk before I started the upper limbs, because it gives you a lot of information yeah. without necessarily a full lower limb exam. Uh, so that may be, so I actually did that in my paces, I asked the patient to walk before I did the exam, um, but I didn't this time, probably stage fright. <laughs> okay, so uh, as I say, we've got, I think it's about 15, 17 minutes left. We've not had any question and answer at all throughout the whole uh, preceding uh, session. So I think Junaid and I, and perhaps Abram too, we are, we are open to questions and discussion about any aspects of everything that you've seen this morning. Yeah. I have one question about... Are we having a mic? Or? Yeah. So we were, talk we were talking about uh, uh, making the patient walk, uh, a neurological patient. Yep. And, uh, uh, you know, she mentioned, yeah, maybe we should make the patient walk first. And I said, well, when I enter the room, I don't know what his or her strength mm -hmm. is. And at the beginning of the exam, before I even examine the patient, I would probably be a little more cautious yep. in first examining the patient. Then I know the strength is good and whatnot, and then make the patient walk to see the gait. Yeah. So, uh, so what would actually happen with that? Because you're quite right. Our patient could have had, and the candidate doesn't, yeah. has no idea, they could have had you know, a spastic paraparesis and being completely unable, or paraplegia and being unable to walk. So the important thing in that situation from our point of view is that the can candidate um, either picks up early doors that the functional disability is such they won't be able to walk, or they say, may I walk the patient? They get into the exam routine and we say, no, that will not be necessary because the patient can't walk. Uh, so that was the way, that's the way we would kind of handle that. The uh, question back here. The, um, are the examiners, as they, as they calibrate beforehand, are they blinded to what the underlying problems may be with the patient so that they can try to not be as biased as possible? Yeah, well, I, I say I'm, I apologize. I rushed through that in those slides. Yeah, they, 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 they uh, examine on their own and without reference to what the, in inverted commas, actual or correct diagnosis is. And the old form of this exam, the, you know, the junior staff who would, who would gather the patients and get things organized would typically provide a description of each patient, what the diagnosis is and what the physical signs were. And what we found was, as you can imagine yourself, that signs change. You know, so somebody who was recruited a month ago with a fantastic pleural effusion turns up and there's nothing there. And the risk then is that the candidate, if the, can if the examiner does not examine the patient themselves, is being examined on something that does not exist. So that's why we've changed that. It has to be based around what the examiners themselves actually find on the day and believe that it is reasonable 
for uh, a learner at this level to find. Yeah. Is this an exam to define minimal, minimal clinical competency? Because I have a very hard time believing that only 65% of your trainees are minimally competent. Uh, I, I, well, I think that uh, I, I, I think that this exam does does not drive excellence in bedside clinical skills. You may have a different view on that, but it it, it, it assures there is a minimum standard of competence in bedside physical exam, history taking, and communication. Because I'm just surprised that the pass rate is 65%. To me, that seems either like the, the, either the training is not good enough for the exam or that the exam is way too difficult for, for the or candidates. It's, or it's measuring something that's not relevant to what they do from day to day. Could be uh, another argument. And some people would argue that examining in that way without a history is, is false. As I said, it hones you in on the physical exam. Some of our other encounters, though, are integrated physical exam and history. We don't do the old long case anymore. We've compressed it down when the candidate does have to take a focus history and do a targeted exam. But these are the kind of compromises and tensions you have when you design a uh, clinical skills exam. And is the exam videotaped so that the candidate can contest whether or not they, in, whether in, they in, passed or failed? In, in some, in some centres it is, but not universally. Uh, we have a, actually, we have a very low uh, appeal rate. Uh, unsurprisingly, when a candidate's uh, just a marginal borderline failure, uh, and they, they, they all get to see their mark sheets, if they see that two examiners have disagreed, yeah, and one's given, in fact, the, the grading scale includes a borderline mark, that if they fail by one point, and one examiner's made them borderline, another one said they were satisfactory, they'll pick up on that, yeah? And strangely enough, they always believe that it's the examiner that gave the lower mark that's wrong. <laughs> now, so we have a low appeal rate. Junaid, I think you wanted to say something? On that note about why 35% of UK trained graduates fail, I think personally, having seen the other side of this, it's, it's from the presentation. So I've taught a lot of, sort of residents who are fantastic at exam but cannot marshal their thoughts and cannot deliver. And I know that's not the most important part, but it's the last part of the exam and it's what leaves a last impression to the examiner. So if you can't present, so I think the clinical skills are fine. I think in my experience has been the actual presentation and the discussion has been what a lot of people really kind of fall apart. Although in these seven skills, the, the one that is most commonly failed, remember I said they've all got to be passed individually, is B is identifying physical signs, actually finding things that are there and not making things up uh, that, that, that are not there. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Uh, here. So I, I had a question along the same lines with the 60, 65% pass rate. Do, is, are there thoughts about um, training differently in order to um, have a higher pass rate? Or does, do people eventually pass on the second try? Or do 35% of people never get to go, never go on and become okay. physicians? Um. So most of my peers passed within three attempts. So if you don't pass within a third attempt, then I, I don't know what, I guess you have to find a different career. Well, you are, you're the regulators for so the General Medical Council, they permit a maximum of six attempts yeah. at this exam. Uh, it, it is extraordinary for a UK trainee to not progress because of the exam, right? In fact, the pass rate is lower in the part one written, yeah, hmm. it's 55% or so in the part one written. The part two written is a much higher pass rate yeah. and paces, as you've heard, is about 60%. So, you know, I don't know. I, I think it, it would be fantastic, wouldn't it, to fly 50 US residents who'd had a bit of coaching for the exam over and see how they did in paces or bring paces here and see what the relative pass rates are. But as I also said in my talk, who knows what it ultimately means in terms of differences in patient care at the end of it. We're holding on to it for the reasons that I've explained. You may see it differently. Yes. Are the patients compensated? Yes, they are. Yeah. Not, not a lot, I would say. Uh, and it actually varies a little bit from centre to centre that you go to. Uh, the hospital is usually compensated for the use of its facilities too. 
The examiners are not. They're only paid their travelling expenses. <coughs> yep, down here. So you have 2,000... You have 2,000 examiners, and I'm, and I'm curious about the training for the examiners, because yep. at some point you have to decide satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Do you, yep. do you determine you know, what the threshold is for unsatisfactory when you're preparing for the exam? So does he have to do three out of five of the, of the skills that you expect, or four out of five, or five out of five? How do you, how do you establish that threshold? For the pass-fail standard, do you mean? Yeah, for when you have to rate, I, if I have to rate him on his yep. physical exam and I'm yeah. looking for tone, strength, yep. deep tendon reflexes, cerebellar, yep. and gait, does he have to do all five or three out of five or nope. four out of five? So, 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 so it, it, it is, we use that fantastic and much now undervalued commodity called judgment. <laughs> yeah? Um, and I'm a great defender. Uh, of judgment, because judgment is the commodity on, upon which my, parent, uh, my patients flourish or founder. And if it's good enough from day to day in the wards for me to apply my judgment, I should be able to use my judgment when I'm looking at a young doctor and make that call. So we are deliberately pushing back against tick box OSCEs in which you get a mark if you pop your stethoscope there. But in, in, in doing that, we're accepting that doctors will vary. Yeah, yeah, if you ask 100 doctors one question, you'll get, I don't know how many different answers. The same applies here. Not every examiner will agree. Uh, all examiners get feedback on their performance, so we measure what they call their hawk dove index, how often you know, they're using uh, unsatisfactory and satisfactory, how often they agree or disagree with their co-examiners, and we, we pick out people who are outliers. Yeah, lots of hands. Ginny, did you pipe up? Yeah. <laughs> So the, the question that I had is, so you're, this is a one, once in a lifetime exam that you end up taking for the MRCV paces? Yeah. Okay, so you're just doing it at the end of your residency as opposed yeah. to, I mean, for our USMLE, step two CS, you do it towards the fourth year of medical school. So do you have something similar in medical school or? Because what I'm seeing is, I mean, we're just, this is a more rigorous, exam that you take at the end of your postgraduate training as opposed to a maybe not as rigorous exam that you take at the end of your at the end of your medical school um, do you I mean what do you see as the difference between the two so yeah. uh, can I say uh, as I alluded to in my talk we uh, medical school finals are with real patients with real signs in a very similar um, scenario I was taught at Oxford that at medical school I'd be expected to hear the aortic stenosis murmur but I wouldn't be expected to hear the associated AR moment that the patient had. At paces, I wouldn't get away with that. So it's just that kind of calibration, I was told, which is that you do the same exam, but the interpretation and the, and the detection and your, and your synth synthesis is different. But medical school findings are pretty, pretty tough. I mean, they're, they're real patients in exactly the same scenario with the same kind of pressure, and you know, the, the, uh, the stakes are as high because you, you can't even start as a doctor. Okay, I mean, the things I would say, uh, the, the closest parallel here to the organization MRCP UK is, is American Board of Internal Medicine, but you'll be pleased to hear we have nothing to do with maintenance <laughs> of certification. Um, uh, and in fact, as, as you also probably know, there is not a knowledge test in the UK as part of maintenance of certification. I know that that's been controversial here. Uh, there are lots of discussions about if you had an exam of some sort, what would it actually look like? for people who've already been certified. But there's that difference. The second is that, uh, remember in the UK, when you complete this section of your training marked by the passage of MRCP UK, that we call core medical training, that's equivalent in timing to the end of residency. In the UK, you don't then become anything. You're not certified to become a hospitalist. We have no equivalent. You must go on into higher specialty training. Yeah? So that's, that's a big, big difference. So this is a certification exam that allows you to progress on, not to pro, pro, uh, uh, practice independently. And then the, the final thing about the comparison with USMLE, well, you know, I, I think they're poles apart, um, and I hope you do see that today. I went to Chicago to see USMLE, and it's fantastically delivered. It's military in its precision, but there are no real patients. And how much can you really simulate? So in the desire for standardization, there are no real patients. You're not observed by anybody other than a camera. You're marked on a tick box framework by, uh, by the SP. Now that's a way of doing it, 
uh, licensing level. And it's, as far as I understand, been very effective here in the USA, but more so, I think, for its purpose in ensuring that IMGs who come into the country are on a, on a level playing field than for US uh, graduates. So we, at the moment, in the UK do not have a national licensing exam. Our universities, as Junaid has said, run independent finals. We're under a bit of pressure, though, to follow your model and to have uh, a lower level clinical skills test uh, at the point of uh, graduation and licensing. Yeah. So have you been to the old uh, Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, there is a flashback to that example. <laughs> but uh, um, we actually, um, I, we conducted, uh, I'm, a, I'm at the University of Rochester in, uh, in New York, so I've had a kind of a version of the PACES exam for the medical students there as well, and for the residents too. So it's informally done. I can tell you, th there's two things you did very well. So two things that you did which I like, which none of the students I see here doing, you stood at the bed, at the, he at the, at the foot end of the bed and observed and examined the patient. So you took a few moments to do that. And secondly, you asked the patient if she had any pain before you started examining her so that you can just be you know, wary of that. Uh, the, the informal exams that we've done here based on the PACES model, uh, and if you are interested in this, uh, about 10% pass rate at the University of Rochester in the second year of residency. Now, I may not well, be, I may not have been as uh, diligent as you were, but that was just a crude number. If you're looking for a comparison, sake. Okay. So, so, and I think as I tried to say during the talk, I'm not trying to suggest this is the only way or the best way uh, to do it. And I'm sure colleagues from Australia and Canada will have thoughts about that in particular. But our, I think our point is have something. Yeah, it doesn't need to be summative, high stakes, but have something that shows what level your own residents uh, have got to in their training. Yeah. with uh, Janae not completing the full examination, yeah. but then very well answering the questions and you could see his critical thoughts and that sort of next level of understanding of what he was actually finding. Would that have passed? Sorry, was that because he didn't do the lower limbs fully? Right, but well, everything else that followed, your questioning of him. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, what, what, you know, you could say if we were gonna be stickly about it and we said they must complete their upper and lower limb uh, exam that he would get a borderline or an unsatisfactory for that A, for skill A. But that doesn't translate into any of the other skills, yeah? Yeah, if, he, if he'd done well in all these other skills, he'd get satisfactories across the board. So each, each we're, tr we're trying to imagine that each of these skills is separate. And as sure many of you are thinking, they're not. There's lots of overlap. But we came up with this model of seven skills faced with a competency-based curriculum that had something like 400 competencies in it. So we felt pretty good that we'd got down to seven, actually. So, uh, Ab Jerry. Abraham uh, asked me to uh, recount my experience taking the orals. Uh, I'm probably the only person here who ever took the oral exam in internal medicine. Um, and uh, it was uh, terrifying. Um, <laughs> The, the um, first of all, uh, we examined two patients, and um, there was, uh, and there were two different examiners. So the first thing that happened is that I arrived in the uh, uh, at the uh, entrance of the uh, Veterans Hospital in New York, and uh, the first thing that I uh, found was that people were milling around, fellow examinees and uh, would say to, the, to uh, us, don't get so-and-so. He's a terrible examiner. In fact, there was no choice. You got what you got. Uh, and so um, the, um, we, we were allowed to talk to the patient. We were allowed to ask the patient uh, questions. Uh, the first, and, and uh, so you had to, in the, in the space of the time, you had to examine two patients. Uh, the first patient I saw was uh, an obvious cirrhotic. I asked him what was wrong with him. He said, I have cirrhosis. <laughs> That'd make it easier. And he was right. <laughs> so, so you know, the interesting thing about this 
this experience was that since it's so traumatic, you never forget it for your entire life, as you'll see. So I, uh, I, went, I examined them, uh, went over them, I think, fairly thoroughly, and then left to see my second patient. The second patient had um, cardiac pain. I can't remember exactly what. But um, as I was taking his history, I, I was taking a, a sexual history from him, and I remembered that I hadn't examined the first patient's testicles. <laughs> and I knew that I would fail if I hadn't done that. It w and so I raced through the exam <laughs> of the first patient, of the second patient, and, uh, and decided that he had what we then called coronary insufficiency, and then dashed back to the first patient's bed, they ripped down his shorts, <laughs> <laughs> and his testicles were small. So, and within seconds after I finished, my first examiner showed up for, the, for this patient. So, and I was, you know, I was shaking by that time. And, and shaking in part because there was a rumor, which was not just a rumor, that some examiners were tougher than others. In fact, one examiner was called Blackjack because he failed everybody. And, and, and so, what sh so this examiner showed up. He's, uh, he was a, um, I can't exactly, I wish I could remember his name, but he was a, he was a, um, um, a long time Boston academic physician. And uh, so he said to me, where, uh, where are you from? I said, well, I'm, in Boston, but I'm not from Boston. And he, and he said, well, then you all, you have all the advantages of being from and not to or something like that. And, you know, he, he was trying to put me at ease. And then he, he started, he went to the bedside, went, talked to the patient briefly, and um, then examined the patient. And he said, uh, did you feel the spleen? And I said, no. And, um, he uh, went back to the bedside and felt again, and he said, here it is. And so I felt again, and I couldn't feel it. So he, so he took my hand and put it on where he felt the spleen, and I still didn't feel it. So I said, so I can't feel it. Uh, and he said, okay, and he went on to the next, next question. And I said to him, uh, is it there? And he said, young man, I asked the questions. <laughs> you see, I remember verb, every, every event that happened. And I, there's more to the story, I won't tell you anymore. <laughs> but the, the, the moral of the story was, it was a terrifying experience. It was, um, uh, it was arbitrary. Uh, and um, I passed, by the way, <laughs> to tell you that. Okay, well, I think we're... Th th thanks, uh, Jerry. I think... Uh, Abram, did I you just want wanted to, to say that for folks who don't know, this is Dr. Jerry Kassir. He's an emeritus visiting professor at Stanford, comes here every month, former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and you will be hearing from him at lunchtime. Thank you so much, Jerry, for sharing that. Yeah. So, so just to... to to wrap up, because we, we, are, we are out of time, I think, Jerry, you must be thrilled to see how much it's changed. Uh, my view is that in 19... I'm terrified to take that again. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, my view is that I think I've made my view pretty clear already. I'll state it again. That in 1972, there is no doubt that some bathwater was thrown out by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Some of the problems that you talk about. But the question for everybody is, was there a baby? A very, very precious baby in that bathwater. And if you're prepared to accept some of the compromises that these kinds of assessments made, I would continue to, uh, to say that despite the, the fact that they can cause uh, learner anxiety, that they're worthwhile. I should just end by thanking Junaid and Jules, who we couldn't...
we, we cannot do any of our teaching, learning and assessment without patients, so we're particularly grateful uh, to Joe coming along. Uh, and to you all for, for participating, I say happy to discuss anything further outside. Thank you very much. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.